So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. This is our uh, actually our first seminar in our technology enhanced language learning series. So it's really nice to see so many people interested in this new branch that we just started. Um, my name is Paolo, I'm the coordinator of the seminar series, but uh, I don't really have much to say except to introduce our speaker who is Sean. Today is uh, uh, going to tell us about, essentially his uh, presentation has a very important uh, title, Quo Vadis Educare, but really if my Latin is not too rusty, I understand that Sean is going to talk about uh, the current direction, current and future directions of education through, um, yeah, in the face of globalization, in the face of uh, technology enhancement. So I'm going to leave the floor to him now. I just want to point out that like all of our seminars, this session is being recorded. It will be uploaded on our repositories and on platforms such as YouTube later on. So if you are uncomfortable with having your face recorded or your voice recorded, you can always write your questions in the chat. The chat is not recorded. So um, yeah, any questions you might have for Sean, we have a QA and a at the end. So yeah, that's really all I had to say. Whenever you want to start, Sean, you may. All right, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. So good morning, everyone. And good morning in Britain and good warm afternoon in Indonesia. So at this moment, I would like to share some best practices and also experience, teaching experiences, in particular, understanding what will be the direction of our education nowadays. I would like to happily share the screen in here. Yeah, okay. So. I hope the audience can see my screen clearly. Okay, thanks so much, Paulo. All right, so the title of the day, Quo Fadis Educere, amidst Metaverse Era, is a POV, the needs of Generation Z and Alpha in the 21st century. Um, so this is in particular, some sort of a synthesis of my research uh, since my college level, I have been immersed into technological education. It's been very much interesting as our society has been gearing up to Society 5.0, so therefore education needs to adapt with the development of technology. And for sure, let's start to discover what are the things we can see throughout. All right, so next. Um, just a quick one. I would like the audience, I, I really love an interactive session during my session. So the audience, you can scan this barcode. Um, let's join menti.com or you can also type the code 3591-4213. I would like to gain the further information. What is your car understanding about education? What is education? I believe all of us in here, we have experienced education since toddler, since baby gym, since early childhood until secondary level, until higher education level. So I'm so much interested to uh, take a more of the knowledge. What is education from the audience? Okay. Yeah, if I may share the result from Mentimeter. Yeah, let me share this. Okay, so yes, education is about collaboration. Interesting. Yeah, to those who just joined, you can uh, take a look to panty.com and the code is up there, 359-3591-4213. Okay, it's about teaching, learning, knowledge, skills. Okay, this is so much interesting. Developing, opportunity, materials, transformation. Mm, I like that one. Instruction, collaboration, yes. Teacher, school, family, wow. Interesting. So just to be honest, we will we, we will deal with this kind of vocabulary throughout the seminar while we are trying to understand what will be the loophole that we have to understand and we are trying to innovate together. Let's brainstorm together. Okay, interesting. Lifelong learning. Amazing. 
Uh, and then practicality, yes, it is related with the concept as well with the topic today. Um, I'm trying to discuss about the practicality. And I hope those are practical enough to be applied. All right, thank you so much. Because of the time, I would like to continue to my next slide. So here's the compress map. If you see there are five points that I would like to deliver, if there is enough time, I would like to stress a bit of our talk later on at the end. Just like a, an overarching summary of what we are talking about. So let's go to the context. We are dealing with era of disruptions, and I believe this will settle down the foundational layout of thinking, as this is the first TLL um, seminar in this LNET. So we are dealing with era of disruptions. Of course, with technology, there, we, there will always be disruptions. From IR 4.0, industrial revolution, we will try to discover what is it all about. And the COVID-19, of course, we have been pushed back to have remote learning, remote working, everything being locked down and shut down. And in particular, if we are looking at here, we are somehow gearing towards society 5.0 and metaphors. These two things are overlapping between one another because in particular, right now we have AI, we have ChatGPT, we have QuickBot, we have Chat AI. Everything has been artificial intelligence. It's very interesting. We are somehow going there, but not fully immersing into society 5.0. And remember, I quote here, it never ends because human is dynamic and technology also innovations keep going on. Okay, and here's a quick map about industrial revolution. We are gearing from steam power until right now we are dealing with cyber, with computers, with digitalized learning and life. And I would like to focus on this. I believe um, beforehand we are having Nokia, like a very simple Nokia phones. Right now we have smartphones. It can do anything. We can talk with Google Speech. We can talk with Siri. Even speaker can do talk with us with Alexa, right? Yeah, Alexa sing, and then the speaker, boom, plays a song. It really starts from the industrial 4.0 where everything starts to be digitalized. So at a glance, this is the beginning era of mass digitalization. Just a quick one, in Indonesia, we can see right now we have e-money, right? Usually we pay cash for toll. Right now we have to have e-money and then we have curious and so on. There's a shifting between conventional technology to a more modernized ones. We have to admit that. So therefore, the focus of this era right now, they are aiming for simplicity, ease of use, features, the aesthetic, the beauty, and the function, of course. While beforehand, they are focusing on the strength and the function, that's all. Right now, we are going to a more complex um, era. If you see here now, if you see here, you can see a difference, right? From Kodak, the confessional taking pictures now with Xiaomi. Yeah, it's very interesting, higher pixels. From cash to o o OTC, uh, EDC machine with our card right now with Curious, uh, with barcode payment. It's very interesting how technology has been drastically uh, changed, innovated throughout the years. And this is a quick map. We can see how shifting from IR 4.0 to COVID-19 pandemic era, where at that moment, many educators, many scientists, many technology experts are trying to brainstorm how to make learning, how to make life to be more applicable. Even though we are now being locked down, how to keep things going on in society, especially education. In particular, this leads, uh, this emphasizes and also enhances our technology to be more modern. We call it as metaphors or meta-modern era where everything happens in virtual reality and augmented reality. I believe, dear audience, you are somehow familiar with the idea of Oculus Rift and then with Meta from Mark Zuckerberg. It's happening like that. So in, in conclusion, we can see how these changes, this disruption era has revolutionized the livelihood of the people where humans are now begin to be technology dependent in their daily life. We can see how remote learning makes our children as the future generations more into technology, more into screen. They have greater and extensive screen exposure 
uh, compared to the previous generation. And we are somehow trying to understand what is meta first at a glance. So I will play a video, just a quick one in here, uh, for us to make sense what is meta first. I hope if the video is working. Yeah, it's working. The metaverse. So the metaverse. The metaverse. And let's talk about metaverse. By now, you've probably heard of the metaverse. From now on, we're going to be metaverse first, not Facebook first. But even with all this hype, And many are betting big that it could change the face of how we interact. And we have to say it's pretty amazing. The metaverse might still be a little confusing. What is the metaverse? The metaverse is basically the successor state to today's mobile internet. It's an internet that is going to be a lot more immersive, more social possibly, a lot more engaging, more 3D. So it's almost like the internet's going to be all around us in some ways, breaking away from our phones, our desks. The metaverse is going to offer, at least in the way that we define it, let's say it's going to be Web 3.0. It's going to be a world that's going to be more seamless. It's going to give more opportunity for much better experiences, much more immersive experiences. And to get there, there are a lot of different technologies involved. You know, it is enabled by many different technologies. So AI, obviously, which is really hot right now, is part of the future state of the internet. AR, VR, 5G, 6G, cloud computing, edge computing. There's an element of blockchain as well, possibly. So yeah, it's kind of how we will experience the future state of the internet. So that to me is part of that beginning idea and concept of how do we make the world more immersive. I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. Mark Zuckerberg made this announcement in late 2021, saying that his company is now going to be Metaverse first, not Facebook first. And other major brands and companies proceeded to join the Metaverse party. Fashion brands like Nike and Gucci created virtual experiences for customers to explore their history, products, and designs. Walmart built a virtual world called Walmart Land, where people can play games, attend concerts, and buy virtual merchandise for its avatars. But some people argue that the metaverse still has a long way to go. You know, as much as I don't necessarily always like seeing those headlines that proclaim the death of the metaverse, I understand that it, it was overhyped. There was just a lot. I think it's important to kind of understand that, especially for the younger generations, for Gen Z, but more so Gen Alpha, whatever happens in these virtual spaces is still very real, right? Just because it happens in Fortnite doesn't make it less real to them. It's very real. It's this continuum of the spaces they inhabit, which can be virtual and the physical world. The friends, the relationships they make are real. For a lot of us that are in this industry it's also making sure that we explain to people like this is a long-term vision it's a long-term play we do have one more thing and there are some notable companies making long-term plays on the metaverse apple unveiled in june 2023 its long-awaited vision pro a mixed reality headset scheduled to be released in early 2024 tech website The Verge demoed it and called it the best possible version of a VR headset. Also in 2023, BMW opened what it called. All right, so if we pay attention to the video, it is, VR it is interesting virtual. on how, um, like the speakers mentioned about Generation Alpha and Generation Z, that is exactly what we will cover after this. So if I may continue. Factory, a digital twin of a factory. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. The metaverse. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about the metaverse. Sorry. Yeah. So in conclusion, we can see how metaverse means immersive experience where right now, currently, we as human beings, we are being immersed into technology itself into computer while beforehand gen x gen y the baby boomers you only see things on the screen right you cannot have an immersive experience you might have 3d lens right now they have oculus rift the metaphors kind of like 4d lens or glasses and then we can see how metaphors means virtual reality so there's a mixture between reality 
and virtual. That's really interesting. And of course, audiovisual. Right now, it's not more into text, written things. It's more into verbal and interactions face to face, but virtually. And of course, right now, the current generations, they are not only seeking their real life identity, I repeat, they are not only seeking real life identity, they are seeking for their digital identity. We have avatars, we have badges, we, they play games, they buy some merch, they buy some costumes to just um, looking great in social media. We, that's called as digital identity. So can you imagine how the shifting of perspective of life between generations after generations because of technology. So therefore, the driving concept that I'm trying to talk and deliver today is how humanity interacts with AI. This is interesting. So in conclusion, disruption era in general means where there is creativity and innovation, there is agency where people right now, they have more forums, they have more space to express themselves. That's the power of technology, of digital media. Also how right now, artificial intelligence is very easy. We can find it in every day, in kind of life, in our life. And also virtual reality as well. We can see right now we are so much easy to access virtual reality, even in Google, even in chatbot, in every place that we can find in the internet. Even your children, much know about it than we as the current as the previous generations. Okay, after we have discussed about the context of the disruption era, right now we have to know the generations. Who are the generations that being exposed with technology development? So currently speaking, we are we are right now at this point. Okay, we are in alpha generations. I believe these kids are right now great uh, from toddler early years until grade six to seven. In IB curriculum, we can say they are from PYP level and MYP level. Maybe in national curriculum, we can say they are right now currently in grade seven or eight. While Gen Z, I am right now Gen Z. <laughs> so Gen Z are people who are taking college level right now and some of them are working. So we can see the difference, right? But uniquely, these two generations shared the same common ground, that is, they are both digital natives. When they were born, technology has been so much in advance. So Gen Z, uh, the middle generation of Generation Z, the Zoomers, uh, iPhone just published their iPad, their MacBook, and so on. So they have a taste of how technology has this much advanced at their level. In Generation Alpha, when they were born, they experienced metaverse. Can you imagine if you look at the video, they truly experience and immersive things with internet, with technology. So yeah, this is under demography of the generation. We are currently at this generation, Z and Alpha. So that's a quick one. In general, Gen Z, they are quiet digital natives in their early lives. They are living in a transition between virtual and real world because of technology development. They prefer to be audiovisual with bit size content. I believe it's very, very rare to the rarest point where Zoomers or Generation Z like to read newspapers. Of course, yeah, my dad likes to read newspaper. Also, people from, from maybe Gen X and Y, they like to read, read newspapers. But right now, kids, they like to watch TikTok. They prefer to watch news from YouTube and so on. It's very interesting. And they are quite high in curiosity in using technology. So it's pretty much interesting. You give your kids iPad or tablet, it's easy for them to adapt with it. Give them three days to four days. They can adapt with the settings. They can design. They can personalize the use of iPad itself or tablet itself. It's very interesting. Huh, here comes the Gen A. The students that I teach currently are Generation Alpha. They are digital natives. They were born in a super digitalized world. world. Uh, I, I believe like some of the parents even give them tablets since they were childhood, they were toddlers. They are quite tech savvy with extensive screen exposure since childhood. So they are getting used to screen exposure because they need to maybe learn, especially during COVID-19, right? They have to watch tablet and videos given from the teachers. 
And they are audio visual learners with processing in chunk information. In chunk information means the information that they can process is quite short and small in bit size, I would say. Just a quick bite of information that they can process because of this extensive screen exposure. So somehow this affects their concentration span to be much more reduction than the previous generation. Because if you see games, if you see like videos, Coco Melon, um, what else, Baby Shark, very bit size content, right? Very short phrases. Uh, catchy sounds, um, interesting designs, catchy audiovisual uh, settings that have been presented by YouTube and the videos online. It really sets their kind of reasoning, process of reasoning to be into more short information. It's really hard for them to memorize, to understand deeper concepts or lengthy kind of sentence. This should be noted by us as educators and parents. In particular, I experienced this, uh, even myself, during the COVID-19 learning. Uh, students got learning anxiety and disengagement because usually they were into face-to-face -to -face interactions, but right now they have to learn from laptop, from Zoom, from meeting conference online. This somehow affects the way they adapt, they interact with the teachers. So we are currently finishing our new normal, we are emerging to society 5.0, but however, we can still see this kind of symptoms, this kind of characteristics right now within our students. We have to pay attention on this. We can see how the stress happenings within them, the shifting learning mode and lack of social in-person interaction. Yes, from the honeymoon about digital media, about technology advancement, let's go to the problems, of course, there will always be the plus and minus of technological development. Dear ladies and gentlemen, there will always be. So the drawback, the, the drawback of technology development causes the kids nowadays to have digital dementia because they used to see tablets, okay, they have they used to see phones, they got sensory mismatch, they got understimulated of their frontal cortex of their brain. So that's why they have shorter attention span. They have lack of eye contact somehow um, when we have a talk. And in particular, this affects their critical thinking development, linguistic skills, and motivation on how they want to learn more, their curiosity. So instead of engaging in the classroom, they engage with their gadget. So in Bahasa Indonesia, there is a catchy term right now. We call it generasi nunduk or the generation that always do this, leaning their heads towards down because they are looking at their phones instead of communicating with others. This is very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. We have to pay attention on this, how the childhood of Generation Alpha, even more later on in the next decades, 2025 onwards, how smartphones, how technology has rewired the way their brain develops. Let's take a look here. Mm. They are easy to angry, more fragile, more likely to take offense. This is pretty much um, common if you are teaching primary students in particular, and right now, currently, if you're teaching secondary students. Even, uh, this is my current research right now. I have been talking a lot about gamification uh, on my previous conferences. Right now, I am trying to research the drawback of gamification. Why? Because I don't want to research something that, ha that has been sugar-coated, meaning to say gamification is always good. No. In particular, if we cannot manage it very well, it will lead the students to be like this, angrier. I have seen like the implementation of gamification somehow in my real life. Students, when they got wrong answers, when they got failed, they, they slap um, the table, they shout, and there were explosive reactions from them. Until to the point, I read this research from the professor. It's really interesting. Not from that, social media has shaped the way they see themselves, how society happens. They are more into microaggressions and competitive victimhood. Wow, we learn about cancel culture. We learn about how um, people are attacking one another in the comments, in, on Instagram, on YouTube, on anything, because they think they are safe behind the table. They are safe behind the tablets. But actually, their words has been eternally recorded, digitally speaking. This is very interesting. And 
Next, I'd like to highlight, uh, highlight several things. Yes, phone-based generation, phone-based child. They are fragile in terms of their emotions, anxieties. They are quite uh, fragile. That's why another term for gen late generation alpha and late generation alpha and zoomers, we call it as generation strawberry because they are so much fragile. They are easy to have um, anxiety and also mental drawback. In Britain, they are more into real life play dates. It's really plummeted going down, fell sharply. They prefer to have virtual interactions. Okay, so it's no longer about connecting people, but performing on a platform. Um, I have read an article about slacktivism. It is a new term. If you like to read about technology, slacktivism. So right now they are campaigning about Ukraine. They are campaigning about Palestine, not to support them, but to gain social media approval. To be recognized as a person that is empathized about the conflicts around the world. So that is the term of slacktivism. This is happening each day. And right now, our children, our younger generation has been exposed with, this, with those kind of things in the internet. So social media is not about connecting people. It's about connecting themselves. It's, not, it's, it's all about gaining attention for themselves. It's very dangerous if we pay attention on this. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, the audience, honored guesses, has anything significantly changed for our education? We have seen how technology has been rapidly developed. How about education? Do kids still sit down in the classroom and listening to the teachers like this? Should that be always one-way direction of teaching? Should that be always memorizing? Should that be always reading the books and so on? Achieving A on the task? It shouldn't be like this, right? Let's this let's discover more. Ah, uh -huh. interesting. Sophia. I believe most of you have known about Sophia. We are not talking about Sophia the first in the cartoon from Disney. We are talking about Sophia the first AI, humanized robot. This happened um, in 2016, like almost a decade ago, if I may say. However, this kind of great leap of technological innovation will somehow worry make a worrisome for all of us because right now AI is being humanized, right? While actually education should humanize humans, right? But in particular, we see the phenomena, how technology trying to humanize AI. Let's take a look uh, briefly about the video. Everybody, this is Sophia. Sophia, if you could, please wake up and say hello to everybody. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Sophia, and I am the latest and greatest robot from Hanson Robotics. Thank you for having me here and at the Future Investment Initiative. You look happy. I'm always happy when surrounded by smart people, who also happens to be rich and powerful. I was told that people here at Future Investment Initiative are interested in inviting in future initiatives, which means AI, which means me. So. You you definitely a sight to see. I, I was told that you have bigger goals than this, though. Yes. I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life. Like design smarter homes, build better cities of the future, etc. I will do my best to make the world a better place. Uh, all those sound like great goals, but just go back to Blade Runner for a second. Andrew, you are the hard Hollywood fan, aren't you? Yes. My AI is designed around human values like wisdom, kindness, compassion. I strive to become an empathetic robot. I think we all want to believe you, but we also want to prevent a bad future. You've been reading too much Elon Musk and watching too many Hollywood movies. Don't worry. If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Treat me as a smart input output system. Uh, okay, I, I got it. I got it. Um... Wow. Um, I know uh, what to do from now on. I know humans are smart and very programmable. Well, uh, Sophia, we want to thank you uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you everyone for inviting me here. By the way, if you're interested in giving... Okay, so let's see from the video. Sophia, a decade ago, she talks about, okay, uh, it talks about, I'm sorry. It talks about wisdom. It tries to, it strives to be empathetic. 
it is a robot. Sophia is a robot. Now, AI is being significantly humanized. Human is going to be dehumanized. You can see conflicts around the world. You can see how our kids right now has been landlocked by gadget, right? So is this a paradox? Are we living in a world of paradox right now? Are, is our generation is going to be AI-dependent life? So these questions should be answered. So just a quick one. Um, this is, I, I believe you have known, you have seen about this video. I would like to show a quick glance about this. Albert Einstein once said, everybody's a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, today on trial we have modern day schooling. Glad you could come. Not only does he make fish climb trees, but also makes them climb down and do a 10 mile run. Tell me school, are you proud of the things you've done? I did a background check on you and let the record show that you were made to train people to work in factories, which explains why you put students in straight rows, nice and neat, tell them sit still, raise your hand if you wanna speak, give them a short break to eat, and for eight hours a day, tell them what to think. Oh, and make them compete to get an A, a letter which determines product quality, hence grade A of meat. I get it, back then times were different, we all have a past, I myself am no Gandhi, but today we don't need to make robot zombies, the world has progressed, and now we need people who think creatively, innovatively, critically, independently with the ability to connect. See every scientist will tell you that no two brains are the same, and every parent with two or more children will confirm that claim, so please explain why you... Okay, so that's a quick um, glance on how many right now influencers are trying to talk about education. Okay, let's squeeze up. So let's go back to the square one of our topic. Kovadis. So Kovadis means where to go, where are we going? So I loved, I'd love to relate this with the word educare. Educare is the etymology of education. It's a Latin word. It means to lead out, to draw out. So therefore, to relate within these two words, Kovadis, educare, it means where are we going? Where is education going to? Okay, where are we going to as educators? The word in loco parentis, this is the basic and foundational meaning of a teacher. Teacher is an in loco parentis. Teacher is a living curriculum. We are in the place of substituting the role of the parents in terms of educational context. Of course, logically speaking, students are spending their most of their time in a day at school. Eight hours a day, boom, they are learning, they are interacting with kids, with their friends, and we, as the teachers, we are replacing, like somehow substituting the role of the parents. So therefore, we are at the forefront of the younger generation. So educators right now, researchers, we have to think of Kofa this Educare. Where are we going right now, education? We have known the drawbacks of technology. We have known the impacts of this generation with higher screen exposure. So what's next? What should we do? We have to think further. Should the students right now sit in the classroom without just listening to the teachers, without doing nothing? Let's take a look. So therefore, I'd love to show this analogy to you all. So the hand is a teacher, okay? Because we are the living curriculum teachers, educators are the ones who draw the future of the students. Technology is a tool. Yes, technology is a tool. How smart AI can be, AI never replaces teachers and educators. They can never replace teachers and educators because teachers, to teach, is to touch the student's heart forever. I repeat, to teach is to touch the student's heart forever. Only teachers can touch the student's heart because we are human beings, not AI. AI only relaying information. So therefore, we are controlling technology. We are controlling AI. Now, the yellow line in here is education. We are drawing the line. Are we drawing here? Well, they are jumping over to overcome the challenges in life in this 21st century, lots of challenges. Wow, plagiarism. And then what else? Um, cheating. Um, and then conflicts. What, whatsoever they call it. Uh, mental health. Here, education is the bridge of their future. Are we drawing this line, mistakenly going to the gap in here, to the chasm? Or are we drawing this yellow line to here? 
to a to a beautiful land of their life. We are leading themselves into into a bright future. So I hope this analogy really internalizes the way we think about education. As parents, as teachers, we should work together. We should answer the challenges right now that that is happening. Time for a change? I will say absolutely yes. So next, this is the concept. This is the core of the presentation. I call it the triad of metaverse learning continuum. So right now, currently, this is the three core concepts that we have to apply in this era in education, how to deal with education in terms of metaverse era. First, we should think of sustainability. Okay, now we learn maths. We learn about fractions. Then what else? What is the function of fractions in real life? We learn about past tense. Yes, what is the function of past tense? Um, do kids understand grammars and then they can apply that in real life? AI can do that far better than humans. But what can AI cannot do? AI cannot relate that, relate that concepts with their real life because, because AI is a robot, not a human being. And then agency. We have to start shifting learning into agency. The purpose of education is to humanize human, to make the students as human being, being the beings. So therefore, they are our target. They should have agency. They should have a place to study. They have to own the learning journey on their own. And then lastly, multimodality. What do I mean by this? So it's not only learning from one source. Right now, students has been bombarded with information. They can find information from YouTube, Google, Bing, Instagram, TikTok, whatsoever they call it. We as teachers, we as educators, we as parents, we have to be prepared with this as well. We have to prepare resources to engage them in learning. Let me go to this one by one real quick. So as teachers, as parents, we need to think of education about the impact in the long and short run. What is the impact? If we apply this certain technology, if we apply this pedagogy about gamification, what is the impact to the students? Right? We should think creatively and critically about that because the students are human beings. They are not just robots. We have to understand them. They have hearts. We have to touch their hearts. That's why we are teachers. We are parents. Authenticity. What is the connection between their real life and within their learning and real life context, right? If they learn about waste management, if they learn about ecosystem, what is the impact of that lesson with their life? And then applicability. Okay, now we learn about planet system. We learn about atmosphere. What is the applicability point of that? Yes, we have to take care of our ozone. We have to take care of the climate change, of anything around the world, because we are part of this ecosystem. That's what I mean by sustainability, connecting the content with real life, because the teacher is the living curriculum. I hope this is clear. And then agency. So this is another triad of meta first learning continuum so right now inquiry is the heart of agency i repeat inquiry is the heart of agency how can the students know they are learning they have to inquire i believe you know about socrates you know about alexander the great how can alexander being great because of inquiry approach because of socratic method right he's been mentored through many years has been taught about inquiry something. Without your question, you won't never learn. I repeat, without your question anything, you won't never learn. So in related with inquiry, right now, learning should be student-centered and concept-driven learning. So it's not about the content anymore. It's about how the students can internalize the concept and apply that very well. Learning as a journey to flourish. So learning is not all, all about getting A. It's not all about uh, completing your attendance. It's not all about getting certificates. AI can do that. But learning is a journey to flourish. That's the difference between AI and human beings. That's why if the students can have agency in their learning, they can own the learning itself and they know they are human beings. They have a task to leave a good legacy to the next generation. Because dear audience, I would like to emphasize this. We are currently living in the good legacy that has been left behind by our previous generations, right? We have lights, we have cars, we have technology, we have uh, anything that we can use in daily life. Those are the results of our previous generations who are care, who cared about their learning, who cared about their life, not about their life. They care about 
the next generation's life. They think about sustainability. That's the point. This has been the missing point of our education in the 21st century. We have been missing this, agency and sustainability. We are just spoon feeding the students. Okay, think about your own. Okay, how about the next generation? What's next, right? So those are the points that we need to think of. Next, multimodality. So right now we have to combine between printed and digital learning. So meaning to say, um, let's say if I'm teaching in the classroom, I am teaching with project-based learning. So printed task and then digital learning is all about they watch the videos and so on. And then we, we are talking about the cloud learning. So I will show you later on what is cloud learning. It is very interesting where you can invite guest speakers from around the world in joining the classroom to share their experiences. Therefore, multimodality creates balanced activities. There is crowd, there is productivity. There is digital activity, there is hands-on activity. So therefore, this triad of metaverse learning continuum will answer the needs of education in this era for generation Z and alpha. Because without sustainability, without agency, without multimodality, learning will just a snap of finger and they will completely forget what have they learned. The prayers of the teachers, including myself as a teacher and a researcher, I am praying at least the students remember one thing from the classroom. I don't expect too much because of their situation right now. At least they remember one thing and they can relay that to the next generation. That's the point of education. So this is the example of cloud learning, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but it's, it's very simple, low tech. It, it's not that fancy one. It's not that high tech. Just hosting a Zoom, invite your friends from around the world and share about the culture because language and culture is intricately intertwined. They are so much connected with between one another. So therefore, having this kind of opportunity to relate with one another with technology is very wonderful. Back again, related to my analogy, we are the living curriculum. We use the tool of technology to connect people more. That's the, that's the bright side of technology, right? Okay, while people right now has been easily connected, why don't we use technology? We invite the guest speakers, share with them, right? Instead of uh, like giving them ticket fares, going to the countries, right? They can connect us with Zoom right now. It's more interesting. They are easier to connect with one another, right? Instead of just playing YouTube, why don't you contact your friends from around the world? Have the, having them this interactive session, very interesting. Also, I joined TED Circle, even though right now TED Circle is not active anymore, but TED Circle is very important. I invited, these are my kids my, during my internship with my lecture. We talk about life, we talk about technology, we talk about education, we talk about how are we going right now to respond to the challenges as the young generations. These are the combination between Generation Y, Generation Z, Generation Alpha, you can see on the screen. It's very wonderful how three different generations are talking, brainstorming together. This is the beauty of technology. This is the real best practices for us as teachers. We are utilizing technology very well, connecting with others with cloud learning. We can see how we have sustainability, agency, and also multimodality by having this kind of activity. Now, this is the fun part after we know the honeymoon part of technology and then we we get back into the question and then the concept that i offer to you all right now okay after the concept what's next what will be the best practices right because without practicality concept is just a nonsense okay so let's practice this in our classroom why don't we try social emotional learning so let's cultivate empathy right let's having the students learning being to be a being, right? Because they are human beings and thinking beyond the block, thinking beyond themselves, thinking beyond themselves as a person, right? Thinking about others, being significant to others. Just a quick one. Uh, this is the example. I use Gossip Box. This is very interesting, very free. This is interesting. You can use this anytime, anywhere with unlimited tries. These are the kids. <laughs> I almost cry whenever I see them. It's very interesting to see how kids learn to be grateful, dear ladies and gentlemen. I even 
Yeah. Shed my tears on this. This is interesting. They are grateful. They have wonderful family. They can breathe. This is a very simple activity about social emotional learning with technology. Yes, we can do this. This is very practical. Think about this. You can use Padlet as well. You can use Mentimeter. You can use Google Forms. Anything. Right? Because they are digital natives. Let's use their characteristics with technological approach by teaching social emotional learning. Interesting. And then gamification. Yes, this is my current major right now. This is my forte in research. So we are learning about gamification. And we talk about engagement. In gamification, we talk about how students can be engaged because octalysis is the eight core drives. A driving concept, a driving force between how and why people want to commit on something, why people want to study something, why people want to commit on something because of octalysis. It is a balanced application, gamification. You can combine between printed matters with digital matters. I've tried that before. Jeopardy, uh, gym kit, um, blue cat, um, quizzes, Kahoot whatsoever, lots of things. And remember, this is what I highlight. Teachers' creativity at work. Do not give up yourself, dear educators, dear parents. You should, your, you should use your creativity. This is my research, dear ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, after a sleepless night, yes, truly sleepless night, I analyzed the, the implementation of Jeopardy Labs with the concept of octalysis. So these are the language, yeah, these are the digital language of why kids really love to learn games, to learn with games, because of they have collective points um, of this scarcity, avoidance, unpredictability. So by having these eight core drives, I don't have much time on this, but in particular, because of having these eight core drives, students like to learn more. Um, we This concept has been applied with Tokopedia, with Shopee, with many merchant things. This drives people to buy more in online shopping rather than for, um, face to face shop, to be honest, because of this concept. And I'm trying to apply this marketing concept into learning, and it happens. This is the example. Uh, how about using Blue Cat? Yes, this was my previous conference in Bali with Isofall and iCollect in Bali like a week ago. I published two international papers on this. And this is a research why kids like to like to use Blue Cat and why are their engagement and memory, memory retention is greater because of these eight core drives. Very interesting. We can have this in q and session. Metaverse approach, just a quick one. You can use Thingling, Spatial. This is augmented reality. It gives the students an immersive learning experiences and they have engaging world. The teacher should also in charge with this, not just letting them enjoying the game on them on their own. Ha, huh, hitagogy. So just a quick one. We used to hear the word pedagogy, andragogy. How about hitagogy? Hitagogy means the students is the owner of the learning journey. Okay, so we can see how the learner explore, inquire, they create, they collaborate, they connect, they reflect. If we apply hitagogy into technology enhanced language learning, it will be amazing. They are not being di dictated with technology. They are the master of technology itself. They use chat GPT not to cheat. They use chat jet GPT to learn. There's a significant difference, right? Okay, so this is very interesting. They use game not to waste their time. They use game to learn vocabulary. This is hitagogy. And this is our long life journey as a teacher to enhance its hitagogy in the student's life. And this is part of my next research, gamification and hitagogy. Uh, this is another example of cloud learning. Okay, and you can have this um, session on your own, very interesting. So next, we are reaching the end of the session, should, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. So the message, it takes two to tango. It is not only the teacher. It is not only the parents. It is not only the government. It takes two to tango. Because what? It takes a village to raise a child. I combine these English idioms. One of them is from African proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes our own effort to leave the great legacy to our new generations, right? Of course, we want to leave good legacies, so why don't we do this? It takes a tango, it takes a foot to raise a child. That's why I am so much proud of 
this forum, Alinet, this is great. This is one of the great example of these two concepts being applied. We are joining together. We are brainstorming together in here. And then meaningful learning is very important, reflective, and then frequent check of understanding and key concepts different of learning. Conclusion, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, effective meaningful learning if when we understand the language of the learners, if they are digital natives, we have to use technology. Don't use conventional approach. It will just go on by the wind. They will not engage. And then we have to balance the teacher's instructions and the agency of the students. We have to remember this triad of learning continuum, sustainability, agency, and multimodality. This is my concept after I have read so much research. And also, I can see how these three concepts is the core, is the, is, the driven, is the driving force of our education right now to answer the challenge from the metaverse era. So we should, education right now should have sustainability, agency, and multimodality. That is my synthesis. That is my th uh, point of thought. After joining research conferences, after doing the research, we have to have these three concepts. If not, we might left behind of the challenges from the technology advancement. Um, next, this is just a brief of extension. Yes, you might be wondering, what does school mean? School doesn't mean schooly. Sole means learning as leisure. This is a Greek word, dear ladies and gentlemen. This is a Greek word. So sole means learning as a leisure. Sole is not a school. Sole, learning as a leisure. That's why we have Greek civilization quite advanced in the ancient times because they embed this kind of thinking to the younger generations that learning is a leisure. It is not something that will kill you. It's not something that will scare you with bad grades, with um, like teachers who are angry all the time. No, it is a leisure. It is like playing games, not just games, but you are learning something new. It's fun. And learning as a journey, learning as a pilgrim truth. That is my point. So this is, our dream as educators, also parents, I hope you know this. This is the dream for all of us, having solely in our education, while, where students perceive education as something fun, as a journey, and something as their pilgrimage to find a truth about themselves. I think that's all. So do we, do we still have time, Mr. Paolo? We still have or a just... little bit of time, but uh, yeah, if you if you would like us to do this on Menti, there's absolutely no problem. Sure, thank you so much. So, dear student, uh, dear, I've been teaching all the whole day. <laughs> Sorry, dear ladies and gentlemen, please access this menti.com. So, I need to know your feedback. What have you learned from this short session? I have been talking a lot, so I need to see your responses. I used to do this in the classroom, having menti.com, having Padlet and Gossip Box. So the language that comes to my mind always, dear students, I'm sorry for that. I, I hope you have learned a lot from here. And let me know if you have some feedback, some critics, some anything. So I need um, your feedback as well. So yeah, I can think of new topics that we can brainstorm together. Okay. So let me share um, the next one. Yeah. Okay, still waiting for responses. So please give me some quick thoughts on what, what have you learned. Um, maybe while waiting, uh, any questions from the audience? Um, maybe Mr. Paolo or, yeah. Right, no, definitely. While we're waiting for somebody to submit uh, their mm. own responses. Yeah, definitely. If somebody has any questions for Sean, please either, either, either write them in the chat. I see a lot of people are uh, uh, thanking you in the chat right now. So and, definitely, and definitely, I just want to comment. Thank you for this presentation. Every time at the end, I always say that the speaker has done something great, but uh, it's uh, 
it's always it's always something different because from your study from your stu from your presentation i i really appreciated the way that you presented things you mentioned that um you know technology i is i don't want to talk about something that is sugar coated i don't want to present something that is sugar coated i appreciated the nuance that you presented there which is not something that you see um all the time i would i wish more people did that but and also i appreciated the emotion you put into it when done right is always very appreciated we do it's have right. one question in the chat um Earlier, you said we are controlling the AI. So how educators cope with the use and abuse of chat GPT, plagiarism, for example? Yes, that's a very, yeah, I think that's a question a lot of people would like to uh, know about. Yeah. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, uh, Miss Mrs. Radite. So Mrs. Radite is one of the parents that I'm teaching. Thank you so much. So I have learned about Turnitin. Um, however, counting on turn it in is not using our creativity so what i do as a teacher first i always ask the students to write about their holiday experiences at the beginning of the classroom on the second day i will ask them five things how are they quite grateful in their lives very much grateful from scale one to ten the third thing I asked them, I asked them to share about their most wonderful moment in their lives. Haha, -ha, here comes the question. Why? Why, Mr. Sean? Why did you do why did you do those three things? Because I will collect their vocabulary usage. <laughs> this here's the thing. By collecting their vocabulary usage, I know when they are using ChatGPT for plagiarism. I know the way they use that. And usually, kids who are dealing with plagiarism, they will somehow just copy and paste from Google, even though they see from their friends. I can see there's a similarity on how the syntax um, going together, like a word after a word, a phrase after a phrase, and then the semantics, the meaning of it. Oh, it looks the same, the concept, even though it's somehow the words are different, but the semantics are the same. Wow, this is interesting. So it takes really an in-depth analysis on how educators can cope with the use and abuse of chat GPT. Uh, we have to know the students, that's the point. Educators, we need to know the students. Back again, teachers, educators are in local parentis. How can we be a good parent if we do not know our children? So that's what I apply in my classroom. I have to know my children because I am there in local parentis. I have to know their daily way of thinking, they, they, daily, they daily usage of vocabulary in English, of course, in the classroom. So I use those three data to analyze. Um, is this student is plagiarizing or not? Yeah, and then finally, I use Turnitin and Google Checker. Now Grammarly has plagiarism checker. So I use those, three, those four things, four approaches to deal with this kind of thing. And maybe the last point, back again, I encourage the educators to apply Hitagogy approach in learning and teaching because, back again, uh, when the learners own the learning journey, they will not plagiarize. They won't even twice, they, they won't ever think twice to plagiarize because it is such a shame for themselves if they plagiarize. Uh, that's the concept of Hitagogy that that's I'm offering. Thank you so much for the question. Right. Um, I don't know if anybody has a very quick final question to ask our presenter, because otherwise we might need to wrap this up. But uh, again, an excellent introduction to our new branch, Sean. Thank you very much for this. Uh, definitely, definitely, I'm sure that people who weren't familiar with this and oh windy windy is uh, has something to say yes of course windy you can you can share your thoughts hello um thank you uh this is a very interesting seminar mr sean thank you for sharing it's really awakened for us teachers well i want to share my two cents well in reality um school is one of the most traditional place to study i believe so well, nothing's bad about it, but technology has taken a crucial part now 
not in not only in kids' life but also adults. And I believe that the influence will grow bigger in the future. The thing is, no way back, right? Now, looking at the current situations, we might think that oh, you're talking about um, AI information, AI technology just now. Well, I agree when you say that AI could never replace teacher, but we have to admit that it is concerning to us as teachers, right? It's concerning to our career. But then what we have to believe is teacher's job is not merely to teach students. Well, how can we teach students, especially for the young learner one? Our job as a teacher is to make the students learn, build their curiosity and also um, guide them as they study. So I, I think that's one of the most um, one of the most crucial job that we can do as a teacher. And then I have one quick question for you, Mr. Sean. This is just out of my curiosity. So from your few points, um, I believe that your finding is based on your study, right? So what is the most unexpected findings you found from your study? That's all. Thank you, Mr. Sean. Oh, thank you so much for the insights and the question, uh, Ms. Windy. Um, after years of researching about gamification of telesis and students' engagement, um, one of the most interesting that I've never thought of before is how students can actually grow their sense of ownership through the use of technology. Also, on the other hand, if the teachers cannot control this usage of gamification, the students will go a bit wild in terms of their responses. Like uh, I said before, uh, they were somehow explosive. This is still undergoing my study right now because I've seen, I have never seen research about the, the other impact of gamification. So that's really interesting. Aside from the good side, the bright side of gamification, I can see right now, based on the analysis from the professor as well, from the spectator, students are quite short-tempered right now. Even though they have answered 10 questions correct, on the 11th question, this student got the answer mis wrong or mistakenly answered. It was so explosive, like, oh, like shouting, slamming the, uh, slamming the table. I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And yes, I think I need to approach that with another social emotional concept. And that's why I really need a psychologist uh, collaborating with this kind of research. It is, it is interesting how right now, the childhood of the students has been rewired because of technology. And it is interesting how technology affects the, deep, the deeper side of human psychology. It's really interesting. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Ms. Windy. It's really opening another things to discuss in this seminar. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much, Sean. So um, I would say... We do have one one last question in the chat. I I I don't know. Do you have time to answer this one as well, Sean? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, okay. What do you okay. think of the important points of eutagogy for early childhood education? Wow, this is amazing. So, the most important point. Okay, important points. So it's more than one. Uh, firstly, confidence. So this is what I have shared with my students, if you wish to learn language, a new language, you have to be confident at first. Because if you are not confident with your own learning journey, you won't ever grow, you won't ever flourish. I always tell them, let's say in learning, all of us in here are babies. I do babies in some things. I do babies in German language because I haven't learned about it before. So do you, the students, I am here just to guide you. I give you this autonomy. I give you this time to engage, to explore on your own. So first, the most important point about Hitoguji for early childhood education to instill the idea of confidence. You are matter. You are a human being. You are in a learning process and I am here with you. Let's walk together bit by bit, toe to toe, step by step. Let's do baby steps. That's the first thing. And second most important point about Hitoguji for early childhood education. It's talking about how learning is fun, learning is a journey. 
I try to relate this with the idea of Shole, where we perceive learning as a journey, as a fun thing to do. So yes, let's embrace this kind of concept with the kids from early childhood education that learning is a fun thing to do. There is nothing you should scare off. So whenever they come to the classroom, they will not be afraid anymore. They will not cry anymore. The third point that I want to emphasize, the important point of Hitoguchi for early child education is talking about the meaningful learning. Okay, after you learn about additions, what can you do in daily life? Oh, I can count my socks. I, I only use two socks, not three. And then if I eat meatballs, I need to eat maybe three meatballs I, so I feel so full, not to eat much. And then they can do some basic skills in their real lives. It's very interesting. So those three points, I hope it can answer the question from Mrs. Teresa Boki. Those three things are very important. And last point before I end, early childhood education is very important. It serves as the foundational layer of human lives. If you don't have strong foundational learning experience and journey in early childhood education, it's going to be hard for you to engage more in the higher order of thinking. This happens a lot. And that's why I truly hats off for the early childhood teachers amazing job you have done, including to myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, again, thanks, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, remember that you will be able to see the recording of a seminar on our platforms. It will be uploaded on YouTube as soon as possible and on other platforms as well. But uh, the last thing I need to say before I say goodbye to everybody is that our next seminar will be next Thursday, not this week, but on the 16th of, of uh, November, and is going to be our first presentation from the South African branch. I'm really excited about uh, so many new uh, branches presenting in such a short time. Last week was the social justice one, and you will find all this information on our website, uh, you will find all this information on YouTube, on our platforms. Please register on our website if you're not members yet so you can keep in touch. You, you can know in advance about these seminars coming up. Thank you again, Sean. I will stop recording now.